This is Campaign 2023, the race for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. We're seeing records being broken in every race uh, here in Wisconsin almost. And for Wisconsin Supreme Court, the record is $10 million. It's going to be shattered this time. The record for outside spending is $5 million. And that's almost broken already. The majority of voters, whether pro-life or pro-choice on this issue, probably are unaware of the stakes of the Supreme State Supreme Court election. The outcome of the, the Wisconsin Supreme Court race could have seriously, you know, serious implications for abortion rights uh, for years to come for here in Wisconsin. I have to say, I cannot think of a judicial election in Wisconsin that I've seen uh, in which so much was riding on one seat. Here's Eric Franke and Susan Simon. In just a few days, voters will head to the polls to cast their votes in one of the most important elections the country will see this year. That is the race for Wisconsin Supreme Court, the branch of government that gets the final say over any argument of Wisconsin laws. These seven justices are the ones that decide whether the state's abortion ban remains in place. But there's possibly more at stake. The high court determines the district boundaries for legislators. That sets the number of seats that Republicans and Democrats each get in the Capitol. Now, why are we seeing such a focus on this race right now? The court is split down the middle. There are three liberals on the bench and three conservatives with one swing justice on the bench. The seat that's open this spring, it's from a reliably conservative longtime justice, Pat Rogensack. For liberals who want favorable rulings on abortion or redistricting, they need to capture this seat. For conservatives, they're playing defense, trying to keep the seat from flipping the candidates. On the conservative side, we have former Supreme Court Justice Dan Kelly, first appointed to the court by previous Governor Scott Walker. He lost his bid for a full term in 2020, along with Waukesha Judge Jennifer Doro, a former prosecutor and defense attorney who gained national publicity during the Durrell Brooks trial. Those with the more liberal tag, Dane County Judge Everett Mitchell, he oversees juvenile cases in the county and is a pastor in Madison, and Milwaukee County Judge Janet Protasewicz, who is also a former prosecutor. Next week, voters will, will narrow down those four candidates down to the top two, regardless of whether those judges lean left or right. And whoever goes on to win in April will get a seat on the bench for the next 10 years. So these are the players. But what's at stake this election? Political reporter Will Keneally has more. <laughs> We heard it all through the election last year. This fall's elections, Roe versus Wade is on the ballot. But now, a renewed push by Democrats and liberals to use abortion as a motivating factor, getting voters to the polls this spring. There's just so much at stake. Steve Webb is with Planned Parenthood Advocates of Wisconsin. Uh, electing a judge that, you know, that shares our values um, about protecting the rights of all people is critical. The issue of abortion harkens back to 1973. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. That U.S. Supreme Court ruling legalized abortion across the country, overriding laws in states like Wisconsin that would have otherwise banned the procedure. But the election of 2016 allowed Republican President Donald Trump to shape the balance of the court. I will do my job without any Trump added three new conservative voices to the court, and that solid majority voted last year to overturn the Roe v. Wade precedent. The Dobbs decision reverted the country back to a pre-1973 status for abortion. That reactivated dormant laws like we had in Wisconsin, banning abortion in the state. But the U.S. Supreme Court left some room, saying that states should be the ones to decide abortion policy. The first and most obvious question is, does the Wisconsin Constitution have anything to say about a right to abortion? And that's a question that only the Wisconsin Supreme Court can determine. The U.S. Supreme Court does not interpret state constitutions. So today we, are, we have filed a lawsuit uh, that asks the courts to clarify that Wisconsin's 19th century abortion ban is not in effect. Right now, there are competing arguments in Wisconsin. The state's abortion ban was passed before the Civil War, but there are laws on the books passed after Roe that allow for women to receive abortions. Uh, it can't be both legal and illegal to provide an abortion to protect the health of a mother. 
And it's just a matter of mobilizing voters to sway this spring's election. This will be our biggest effort, bigger than the effort that we led actually for the fall election. Conservatives are working to keep that status quo in place. Gracie Skogman helps coordinate those efforts for Wisconsin Right to Life. But we're laying out the stakes um, with the hopes that, of course, that motivates them to vote for candidates that, that may protect our current law. In November, abortion was a significant issue, but is that energy that they can tap into again? We got a sense of level of urgency. You know, we've been mobilizing, you know, youth, black and brown folks, and folks that want to get involved and make sure that their voice is heard during this election. Abortion is not the only issue potentially on voters' minds this spring. Back in 2011, tens of thousands were descending on the Capitol Square to protest collective bargaining changes. But at the same time, a law firm across the street was laying the groundwork for the district lines underneath their feet. So it became clear that under this apportionment, especially in the Assembly, but also in the Senate, Democrats had no chance. You didn't get a majority of the votes. You weren't going to get a majority of the seats. That was quite clear. It may seem like it doesn't make much of a difference. If a Madison voter moves from an east side district to a west side district, they'll still be represented by a Democrat in the legislature. But shift a few key districts in suburban areas, and you can determine how many Democrats and how many Republicans are in the legislature. This guy's kind of the limit if you're going to throw out all, all those sort of rules I mentioned of like following municipal and county lines. You know, you could do some really weird like pizza shaped, you know, like wedge districts. There are a buffet of different options for these maps, but like picky eaters, you need to get a blue governor and a red legislature to agree on one single plate to eat. But those two are not going to agree, and that's where the courts step in. Uh, redistricting, uh, the democratic process itself. You know, if there was ever any question about the partisan character of the Wisconsin court, I think the election of 2020 kind of ended that speculation, you know, in the most direct possible way. The Wisconsin court has inserted itself, and, and partly inserted itself, partly even pulled, to be fair, into the business of determining how elections in Wisconsin will take place. The court has become increasingly partisan in recent years. The black robes that they wear now have more of a tint to them. For Democrats, if they take that open seat on the bench, it means winning an entire branch of government. That means for issues like district lines or whether somebody needs a photo ID to vote in Wisconsin, Democrats could undo many of their Republican policies from the past decade with this single election. I have to say, I cannot think of a judicial election in Wisconsin that I've seen, uh, which so much was riding on one seat. Coming up next, who are the players in the race? And you've seen ads for this election already carpeting the airwaves. Where is that money coming from? We'll have that answer right after this. We depend on judges to keep our families safe. But Jennifer Doro has a long history of keeping criminals, even sexual predators, out of prison. As a judge, Doro lets criminals off easy so often, a fellow judge questioned her soft treatment of convicted criminals. She even gave a convicted domestic abuser two days to report to prison, time he used to violently assault his own family members. Jennifer Doro lets criminals off the hook, and that has no place on our Supreme Court. Alien tape is strong enough to hold this fishbowl on a moving car. Just peel and stick and make anything stay in place quick. A wooden shelf, a basket to glass, rugs to the floor, and so much more. Alien tape sticks to brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better. Alien tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. If you're dying to try it, here's your chance to buy it. Call 1-800-490-1347 or go to tryaliantape.com. That's 1-800-490-1347. Shop Steinhoffel's President's Day Sale. Relax with new furniture and a free Theragun Prime Massager with a qualifying purchase. Save 35 to 75%, then take an extra $100 off your purchase of $19.99 or more. And shop great bonus buys like a Beautyrest Queen Mattress $3.99, this sofa $5.99, a Queen Bed $6.99, five-piece dining set $10.49. Plus, take advantage of our special 72-month financing. Relax, it's Steinhoffel's. Thanks for joining us tonight, and we'll see you back here at 10. Are you a fan of News 3 Now? How would you like a chance to work with the anchors here at News 3 Now and actually produce our newscast? If you are a strong writer, have an interest in news, a well-rounded education, and have a great attitude, we have all the resources needed to train you to be a valued part of our team. 
The only thing missing is you. Here's your opportunity. Come work with me and join our award-winning team. Apply online today. IRS agent is waiting for your call back. When you've been scammed, when a business won't listen, when you get obstacles instead of solutions, don't give up. Call for action. Tonight at 10, scams are everywhere, but our Call for Action team is here to help. We'll show you how Wisconsin experts say you can protect yourself from some of the most common scams. Don't miss this Call for Action report. Tonight at 10, only on News 3 Now. Welcome back. We are now just five days away from the primary election in the state Supreme Court race. Technically, it's a nonpartisan race. That's how we do it in Wisconsin. The Republican versus Democrat elections are in the fall. Offices like mayor, well, those are voted on in the spring, but this race has taken on a little bit of partisanship. And we're starting to see that in the statements the candidates are making right now. Here again, political reporter Will Keneally. It's that unspoken game that candidates always play. They're running as judge, so they aren't supposed to make any political statements. But at the same time, they're trying to win over voters, many of whom consider themselves either Republicans or Democrats. So we'll tell you what they are saying on the campaign trail so you can get a better sense of where these candidates stand. Starting first with Milwaukee Judge Janet Protasiewicz. I was in a position where I could not sit on the sidelines and sit back and watch, in my opinion, extreme right-wing radicals win that seat. One of the clearest cut positions we've seen a candidate take on the issues comes from Protasiewicz. During our one-on-one -on -one sit down with her, we asked her about some of the issues that we know will come before the court, like legislative redistricting. She wasn't afraid to tell us what she thinks. I think when you have values of fairness, you have a value that everybody's vote should count, that in a democracy, everybody should be heard, it resonates. So while I can't say how I would particularly vote on an issue, I can tell you those values would be brought into the Supreme Court chamber with me. And that's on top of ads that she's running right now talking about a woman's right to choose on the issue of abortion. Compare that with former Justice Dan Kelly. We asked him a similar question. And this is where there's a line on what I can address as a judicial candidate. He's very careful not to nod one way or another in his public statements. But what do we know from his record on the bench? He's part of a reliable conservative voting bloc. For example, he wrote one of the opinions that struck down the governor's stay-at-home orders during the pandemic. And broadly, he says that he defers to the legislature on these kind of issues. Legislature is the one to lead public policy for the state. And then the other two branches, the work they do, that's all derivative of what the legislature does. Kelly is one of two candidates that are backed by conservatives in this race. The other is Judge Jennifer Doro. She's a judge in Waukesha County, and you likely know her from the Darrell Brooks trial last year. On her background, we have some of her application materials when she first applied to be a judge a decade ago. In her application, she says that she disagrees with a U.S. Supreme Court case that protected gay men, striking down a sodomy law in Texas. Sometimes the words, or even the statutes themselves, are stupid. But stupid doesn't mean unconstitutional. It doesn't matter to my job whether I like the words or even to agree with the law. She says that she would be willing to uphold laws that she disagrees with, as long as they are constitutional. Now the other candidate with liberal backing in this race, Dane County Judge Everett Mitchell. He's a background working with juvenile cases in Dane County, but would also be the first black justice elected to the court after Lewis Butler was appointed but lost his first election bid in 2008. I think as an African-American, thinking about how the Constitution was framed without us, even the idea of slavery that was not included in the very language of the, the Constitution itself, but yet was a reality of it, you want a document that both speaks to the living opportunities for how you know, our culture will change and how does that mean for us. And these are the candidates, all vying for the top two spots in the February primary. Now the top two candidates, regardless of party affiliation, will advance to the April general election. There's no question this spring election is on pace to be the most expensive Supreme Court race in state history. We'll hear more from our panel in just a moment, but first, here are the numbers. 
Some estimates show that spending in Wisconsin's Supreme Court race has topped more than $5 million. That's more than halfway to setting the state's record, and we haven't even reached the primary yet. To put that in comparison, that's what we might see a U.S. Senate candidate spend on their primary campaign, which is a much larger scale election than what we have now with an off-year spring election. Most of that spending is driven by outside groups. According to wispolitics.com, 3.7 of that $5 million comes from those outside groups, while $1.3 million is from the candidates themselves. And why so much outside spending on this Wisconsin race? Well, partially it's because not much else is happening right now. Believe it or not, this is the only kind of big race in the nation this year. And it's a race with big stakes that can fundamentally shift policy on things like abortion. And Wisconsin is a crucial state for presidential elections. Yes, there are governor's races in places like Louisiana. Those aren't swing states. If you're a national group that wants to try out, oh, your latest GOT, get out the vote effort, you're looking at Wisconsin saying, I can go into Wisconsin. And where do we see a lot of that spending occur? Violence turned Waukesha's Christmas parade into tragedy. Judge Jennifer Doro. Right now, not many people know who these candidates are. So we're seeing a fight over who can make the biggest first impression on the voters. You'll have candidates like Janet Protasewicz and Jennifer Doro running positive ads, introducing themselves to voters. As we mentioned before, with all those ads on the airwaves, we well expect this Supreme Court race to break all previous spending records. Oddly enough, the election that set the previous record was the Supreme Court race three years ago. As we turn now to our political panel, Brandon Scholes and Matt Rothschild, I want to pose that question first to both of you guys. Is this kind of the new normal? We'll start with you, Brandon, in terms of spending. I think we're always going to kind of see these things be, be big spenders, right? Well, we've seen over the years, over the cycles, where it's come from almost nothing, as Matt has reported, to now millions of dollars. And it's escalated over each cycle. This particular race is dynamic because it is one of the few times when you could see the majority switch. That's driving big money from all sorts of areas for, for all campaigns. But it, this is probably going to be the most expensive, maybe in the country. Matt? Yeah, Eric, we're seeing records being broken in every race uh, here in Wisconsin almost. And for Wisconsin Supreme Court, the record is $10 million. It's going to be shattered this time. The record for outside spending is $5 million. And that's almost broken already and will be uh, broken uh, and will double, triple, or quintuple this time around. Uh, it's happening for a variety of reasons. One is bad decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court, as in Citizens United, bad decisions by the Wisconsin Supreme Court and a rewrite of our campaign finance laws in 2015 that doubles the amount that individuals can give to the outside groups uh, and also uh, the other court decisions just allow unlimited donations from super rich people anywhere uh, in the country to come in here in Wisconsin and tell us who should be on our Wisconsin Supreme Court. Now, Matt, will it have much influence? I mean, this is traditionally a pretty low turnout election. I think we'll have a higher turnout this time. Uh, it's a hyper-partisan time. Uh, people who are interested in politics, especially super rich folks, uh, are throwing their money uh, onto our TV screens and onto our computers and onto our telephones. So that usually gets more people out. So I think we'll have a higher than usual turnout. I hope so. I hope everyone votes. You can still vote in person tomorrow and on the weekend at the Central Library in Madison. If you've got an absentee ballot, hand your ballot in uh, to the clerk. Uh, and you can hand it in on election day on Tuesday. So make sure you vote if you haven't voted already. Brandon, what do you think? Better turnout or maybe they're going to wait and see what happens and then we'll see it in the general? Well, the headline for this race, it's, it's for all the marbles. Mm -hmm. So whoever wins is going to have the majority. And a little contrary to what Matt said, it's maybe not about those decisions, but it's about what could come in the future or could what a liberal majority overturn what the conservatives done. And what you've seen from some of the candidates is actual discussion about issues and how they would vote. The judge in Milwaukee says she's, she has values, she has an opinion, therefore she thinks this is wrong, she's going to overturn it. Well, that's getting people engaged in the race, unlike what you've heard in the past where, I'm, you know, you don't talk about your positions unless you've already ruled. What they're talking about now in these issues are going to get people riled up, and I think we're probably going to see the highest turnout, 
you know, it's usually 19, 20 percent, and it's those people who care, and it's really those engaged. Nobody else really knows. The Prosser-Kloppenberg race took it up into the low 30s. There's no reason why this doesn't go into the mid to upper 30s. I think it's a very high turnout race for both sides because, as Matt said, we all know, it's a partisan race. And Brandon, we, you know, we've got four people in this race, right? So that changes things. How does that make things different? Well, if each side was smart, they'd have their two candidates win first and second. The general election would be over and everybody go home. But that likely may not happen. You probably see one of each liberal and conservative finish one, too. Which, to Matt's point, that's going to generate even more spending, more money, more involvement, more rhetoric, and probably all on a partisan basis. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, Janet Protosiewicz uh, has got the lead right now. She's certainly winning the money chase. She's got more money than the other three candidates combined. As to who comes in second, I don't know. And there's a, a crazy, ugly food fight going on uh, between the two conservatives, which is kind of fun to watch. After this race is decided, gentlemen, and Matt, we'll start with you. How do you see this playing out? What impact? We can't really spell it enough. The impact that this race is really going to have is significant. Well, it's very significant. It's about whether our freedoms are going to expand or whether our freedoms are going to shrink. The Wisconsin Supreme Court will decide issues like abortion rights and voting rights and gerrymandered maps. So people who care about those issues are certainly going to want to go out and vote. Brandon? Well, it's not only a function of do you care about that issue. This is about power. And because if the liberals take over the majority of the court, they will overturn decades of rulings that some people don't like. Conservatives maintain the majority. Those will likely stay in place. So if the liberals win, you will see some major things happen. Probably the one dealing with redistricting could have major consequences for years to come in terms of how our, our lines are driven, who's going to represent you, who's going to be your legislator, your congressman. So there's lots of things that could happen down the road, especially as they go to overturn different rulings that the, you know, the last 20 years have been in place. Brandon, Matt, always great to talk to you, especially about such important issues. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Susan? Coming up next, what questions do you have about this upcoming Supreme Court race? We sit down with a panel of voters and get you some answers. This President's Day, people are buzzing about my highly rated... Exactly, my highly rated bedrooms, like my Tremont Queen bedroom set. Right. My romantic scarlet collection. Go glam with Diva 2. And my Keystone storage bunk bed for the kiddos. Find your forever bedroom at Bob's Discount Furniture. Is this what going viral is? See what all the buzz is about this President's Day weekend at Bob's. As a veteran of our country's armed services, you have already made the ultimate sacrifice. Why should you have to continue to do that? Through no fault of your own, you may be experiencing hardships, such as the inability to pay rent, utilities, or receive other life-sustaining services. And once again, you're called upon by your family to serve and protect. We want you to know we are here to support you. The Veterans Rental Assistance Program was created by and for people living in Wisconsin, with benefit approvals being issued to veterans in just days, not months. It's not easy to ask for a hand up, but we are clear in our mission. No Wisconsin veteran should ever have to face homelessness or lose heat, power, or water again. 833-WIS V-R-A-P. That's 833-947-8727. Turn on Bionic Spotlight Extreme 360, the motion-activated home defense light that looks just like a security camera. It detects even the slightest motion and automatically triggers six ultra-bright LED high beams. Call or go online and order your Bionic Extreme 360 for just $19.99. Plus, get free shipping on your entire order. To order, call 1-800-501-5956 or go online to buybionic360.com. Call now. After a serious crash with a semi-truck, everything can change instantly. Your future 
your family's future, your quality of life. That's why knowledge and results matter in big truck cases. And not all law firms have the know-how or the resources to handle these complicated cases. At Grunberg Law Offices, we have the experience it takes to make sure you're protected. And there's never a fee until we win your case. Gruber Law Offices. One call, that's all. Welcome back. It's hard to get voters thinking about another election just months after we headed to the polls in November. And it's especially hard to reach those voters who don't usually turn out, like students. Political reporter Will Keneally traveled to La Crosse to see what's on voters' minds headed into this election, speaking with student organizers who work to get their fellow students out to the polls. When you talk to like your peers or your friends um, about these upcoming elections in both February and April, are they kind of aware of this at all, or is it way you know over their heads? We're both political science students, so we're talking a lot with people who are in sort of the social sciences. They are talking about it in class. They're already involved. Um, but I do think that just because it's a nonpartisan race, technically, um, and it's not a big like midterm or like federal year, it definitely is like doesn't have the same caliber of interest or knowledge as like a presidential or a midterm year. Were you guys aware uh, that there's a Supreme Court race coming up? Oh. I no. I feel like I should, but I don't. I wish I was. <laughs> yes. Because I feel like I'm socially aware, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> we try. <laughs> yeah, I would say students are definitely still more engaged with federal elections. I mean, over the years, and especially our time here on campus, I think we can see more engagement with local elections, but there's still definitely like midterms, and the presidential election obviously gets most students out to vote. You guys usually vote? presidential election thing. Yes, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for the big election. So. I'm curious to some of the issues that might be prevalent, obviously for young people or just people that you talk to in general. I would say that a big one that we've really seen on campus would be uh, issues with the climate. We've heard a lot of students just talking about um, sustainability, how to be greener. Also, like, immigration stuff like that is, like, an important topic, like, at least in my culture and my family. So that's something I look into whenever these elections come in. Students, obviously there's those big national issues of reproductive rights and questions over um, fairness of elections or just like voting rights in general. I mean, abortion was huge, but obviously that already went through. I would like to see decriminalization and legalization of weed, honestly, and um, forgiveness to those who have been arrested or charged with crimes. Will Keneally, News 3 Now. We also heard questions from those voters like, where do the candidates stand on the issues? If you want to learn more about the candidates, you can see our in-depth sit-down interviews with them at channel3000.com. Voters also asked us how and where they can vote. You can check your voter registration online at myvote.wi.gov. There you can also find your polling location and what is on your ballot. If you have questions about early voting or how to return your ballot, you can reach out to your municipal clerk. The My Vote website has a tool you can use to find your clerk via your address. Early voting locations in Madison will be open at select locations through Sunday. The polls will be open on Tuesday from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And stay tuned to News 3 Now throughout the news and election results. From all of us here at News 3 Now, thanks for watching.